There is a small strip of land in the East River between Manhattan and Queens. In the late 19th century, the island was home to a prison and insane asylum to house New York City's ill and unfortunates who had previously suffered on the streets. Reformers promised that it was a place for the city's mentally ill and petty criminals to be rehabilitated and released, a chance of a new beginning. The truth, however, proved to be much darker. It was a place where convicts doubled as hospital nurses and doctors performed gruesome medical experiments. For many patients, their only offense was poverty, and their punishment was a life of filth and death. Most who arrived on Blackwell's Islands gave up hope. They felt abandoned and forgotten by loved ones and a society that did not understand them or the life of misery they endured. A young, naive girl from rural Pennsylvania became the key to unlocking their story. Her name was Nellie Bly. Nellie Bly was born Elizabeth Jane Cochran on May 5, 1864, near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. By the time Cochran was 20 years old, she found herself restless and frustrated because she found that her employment prospects as a woman during the Victorian era were slim. When the editor of a local newspaper in her hometown of Allegheny, Pennsylvania, wrote a scathing article about the role of women being only suitable in the home, she became enraged and wrote a scathing rebuttal which impressed the editor enough to offer her a part-time job in January of 1885, writing about topics that were in the woman's sphere or perspective. Her articles were popular enough that the editor of the Pittsburgh Dispatch, George Madden, decided to hire her full-time. Madden believed that now that she was a full-time writer, she needed a suitable pseudoname. Madden chose a name from a song written by one of Pittsburgh's favorite sons, Stephen Foster, about a young, pretty servant girl named Nellie Bly. With that, Elizabeth Jane Cochran became Nellie Bly, reporter for the Dispatch at 21 years of age. After only nine months in journalism, she became bored and restless, writing about stories that female journalists, what few of them there were, were forced to write about. She had no interest in writing about gardening or fashion. She wanted to make a difference, do something meaningful. And if that meant leaving a comfortable job in her hometown, she would. And what better place to find something to write about than New York City? In 1887, she moved to Manhattan and immediately began to look for work. She was turned down by more than a dozen newspapers, finally. After four months of rejections, Bly was able to talk her way past door bouncers at Colonel John Cockrell's The New York World to get an interview. In her meeting with Cockrell, her ideas were interesting enough that he handed her $25 as a retainer until he could decide if he could or would use her services. A few days later, she received a message to come at once to Cockrell's office. Cockrell commissioned Bly to get herself committed to the Women's Lunatic Asylum, located on Blackwell's Island. The New York world began testing the waters with a new type of journalism that used female reporters in a new subgenre of reporting called stunt or detective reporting. They had only been waiting on the right person for just such an assignment. Bly practiced and studied for hours on looking like what she believed a lunatic would look like. She put on old clothes and refrained from daily grooming and began wandering the streets of New York. She checked into a temporary home for women and disturbed the patrons so much during the night that more than one boarder believed that Bly was going to murder them all. The next morning, she was arrested. Judge Patrick G. Duffy ordered her sent to Bellevue for examination and reporters in the courtroom that day wrote stories in an effort to identify her. One wrote an article entitled, Who is this insane girl? Within 24 hours, she found herself an inmate of Blackwell's Island Insane Asylum. She wrote, What accepting torture would produce insanity quicker than this treatment? To take a perfectly sane and healthy woman 
shut her up and make her sit from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. on straight-backed benches. Do not allow her to talk or move during these hours. Give her bad food and harsh treatment and see how long it will take to make her insane. Bly witnessed a patient that was beaten with a broom handle and wrapped in a sheet, then submerged in cold water until she was senseless, all because she cried over missing her husband. She witnessed more than one patient beaten and held underwater by nurses. When physicians were told, they said it was only the imagination of their diseased brains. She wrote in gruesome details about mean nurses who choked, beat, and harassed patients, of having to share towels with severely insane patients who had disgusting eruptions all over their faces, and of doctors who sat idle all day long, never interacting with patients. After 10 days, the world sent attorney Peter A. Hendricks to arrange for her release to the care of friends willing to take responsibility for her. Bly was brought to her new guardian. The physician mentioned to Hendricks that he believed the patient had received satisfactory treatment for mental depression and with further care would be completely cured. Two days later, the first half of Bly's report hit the newsstands, called 10 Days in a Madhouse. It was published in two parts by the world and became an instant bestseller for the paper that catapulted Nellie Bly's career and began a movement of reform that made a huge impact on the care for the insane on Blackwell's Island. News of Bly's exploit traveled across the country and it was lauded by reformers everywhere. Most were shocked that so many experts were fooled by a young woman with no special training or background in theatrical performance. It reinforced what so many had always believed. Patients were admitted to the insane asylum on certificates of doctors who were in collusion with relatives interested in having them put out of the way. Bly's work even exposed the great editors of New York who had only recently printed that women could not cross the great divide that separated them from reporters of the first order, meaning male reporters. She was congratulated on a feat of journalism. One newspaper columnist said that her cool courage, consummate craft, and investigating ability are not monopolized by the brethren of the profession. Aside from her professional accomplishments for women, the purpose of her foray into the world of the insane made waves among the city's planners, when weeks after the article hit newsstands requested a $1 million increase in the appropriation for the insane asylum, which was granted. Two weeks after her report was printed, a grand jury was commissioned into the conditions of the insane asylum, and Bly was invited to accompany them. She mentioned that many of the abuses she had reported had been corrected, the food was improved, interpreters were brought in for the foreign patients, sanitary conditions had improved, and the most hateful nurses were fired. Even with such improvements, the grand jury recommended additional funding and the appointment of several women physicians to oversee nurses and attendants, a very progressive idea at the time. Additional funding was approved. Nellie Bly went on to accomplish a lifetime of important and innovative achievements. She exposed the unfair world of women in factories, dangerous working conditions, corrupt lobbyists, and even traveled around the world in 72 days that beat the fictional record of Jules Verne's character in Around the World in 80 Days, all before she was 25 years old. Bly was a pioneer, but more importantly, she understood the art of communication and how she could use it to make the world a better place. Because of her refusal to accept what society said she should accept, she used her talents and courage to use communication as a means of understanding and exposing tough issues, which became the key to understanding the truth about the mistreatment of New York City's mentally ill, as well as pivotal to understanding the role of women in journalism in the Victorian era. For something to be key, it must be of crucial importance. The editor of the New York World newspaper, John Cockrell, summed it up best when he said, Bly's decision to undertake such a perilous assignment revealed the only authentic imagery of the unfortunate and deplorable conditions of the insane on Blackwell's Island. It was an earnest and paramount work of journalism that unlocked not only the protected arena of the inner workings of establishments devoted to care and rehabilitation of the insane, but it also unlocked decades of male bias and preference to be challenged in the profession. Cause it's a very, very... Yeah.